On sale this month from Aridate, the Ambassadors Issue 3 with Travis Charis, the Ambassadors 4 with Olivier Coipel, the Nemesis Finale with Jorge Jimenez, the Ambassadors 5 with Matteo Vifagni and Nightclub 5 for $1.99. You're going down, Marvel DC! Can you hear me okay? Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, yeah. I don't have you yet. Um, okay. that could be, is anything switched off here, sweetheart? No. I've done this so many times, and of course it's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay, is that us? No, no, no. There no. we go. Is that us? We're good? Yep. All good. Amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was... <laughs> so... Hello? Uh, we've we've admired each other from afar, like a, across a crowded room, and we finally get to actually speak to each other. Yes, it's like some kind of online Tinder thing, isn't it? You know, we're, we're yeah, now it's like Tinder. Yeah, it's, it's it's very yeah, it's very uh, <laughs> it's very naughty. <laughs> That's crazy because um, I mean, I think I probably got in touch with you over twenty years ago. You know, and, and we have spoken. Um, I think we've spoken on the phone. Before we actually started collaborating, I think we spoke once, and that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. that was easily fifteen years ago. Yeah, That's crazy. I think it was um, um, because you remember Rochelle, who's now my wife, was yeah. your editor. Absolutely on the authority, and I think we spoke somehow in a tangent capacity there. Like, um, she was um, after we had after we started dating, some uh, she somehow she connected us through through that through that uh acquaintance that you had with her it's taken a while that was 24 years ago i think 20 yeah we left we left wildstorm in 99 yeah that's when we stopped and then we moved over to the europe for a while and yeah so it is shocking how how it feels like five years ago but it was 25 yeah, I think of us being the young guys. I still think of our generation as being the new guys, you know, like the the cool yes. guys, the upstarts coming in. But uh, it's terrifying uh, how good um, uh, all the there's so many good guys coming up. And I mean, I I guess I, I don't know how it is for a lot of the artists that you that you talk to, but yeah. I would say there is like a not a rivalry, but like a competition, right? Like yeah. a you look at other people's work and you, there are people who you're like, that's Everest, never yeah. going to get there. So you kind of like self slot and self, you know, sort yeah. of uh, analyze yourself. And so, you know, you kind of get a sense of where you are, where your what your level is. But coming up now, I'm just like, how are these, like, how did, how, how are they doing this when i look at an artist and i don't know how they did something that like in, impresses me and it frightens me because i'm like i don't i don't know how they did that like i can't i mean you're I can't ever, break it down you're not even evidence you're like one of those weird mountains on mars that they haven't even measured yeah, yeah. yet you know you're like <laughs> come on it's, i mean if uh well i guess the the big obviously the big knock is i take forever right so yeah. it's like if you can if you can be like Brian Brian Hitch yeah. and you can do great work but make make those deadlines he's like the holy grail basically so and he's and he's really hitting it now I mean Brian's doing twelve comics a year yeah. or something I mean yeah. he's drawn like Kurt Swan now you know he's he's yeah. hammering this stuff out and it's still great I mean I was we yeah. had Brian on a couple of episodes ago and Brian is the ultimate guy who second guesses himself he, he was never yeah I, I watched the, uh, the 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 chat yeah with you and, and Brian. His first instincts are correct his first instincts are correct because he's Brian Hitch that's what I always said to him just I, relax you're Brian Hitch it'll be okay he's he's I would say Brian is an excellent mix of like self-confidence and reverence and respect for those who have worked before him right like he's yes. he's so appreciative of of all the people that have, you know, the shoulders that he stood on. Yeah. But at the same time, I think he's well aware that he's a guy now. Like he's he's part of that. He's going to be the guy that ten years from now people are, you know, he's he's going to be a legend yeah. later. You know, yeah. like he's still top guy now, and he'll be a legend later. 
Well, I mean, Brian, I think, I mean, Brian has been around forever, but like, I think he cracked it when he was about 29. I mean, we were all about the same age. We were all born within about I'm, six months. I think months I might be three or four months older than you. So a US so, uh, September 69, yeah, born in yeah. 69, yep. And December 1969, and Brian is April or something, 1970. Yeah. So, and weirdly, there's a lot of us all born about the same time, Alex yes. Ross, Gab yeah. Dennis, and everybody. And I, I've got a theory about this, right? And I think it's, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's quite often a wave of people in comics who are all about the same age, going back 80 years. Yes, yeah. I think it's because the stuff we grew up with was so good, it kind of inspired us to do this job. And the people who grew up in the slightly fallow periods, they're maybe not inspired to get into comics. The way the guys who grew up in the 80s were like, this stuff is awesome. I, I need to do this for a living. And the 60s guys were the same, I think. You know? I think it's also, we were very lucky to be born and be the age we were when certain things happened in the world. That's like, true, yeah. yeah. To be 13 in 1982, 1983, yeah. and have, you know, Superman the movie comes out when I'm uh, eight. Mm -hmm. You know, Star Wars comes out when I'm 10, and then yeah. Empire comes, and Indiana Jones comes out when I'm 12, 13. If there's a better way to like seed imagination, yeah, then things like that, and then the and then when heavy metal starts coming out, and just to get all the the ingredients started turning churning in all our heads, yeah, I think a lot of kids five years earlier, they didn't get those sparks, right? Like they didn't get those those little pearls, right? They were like watching the Taxi Driver, right? Their childhood movies, again? their childhood movies, Taxi Driver in Chinatown. Yeah, I mean, it was so bleak and yeah. and you know, like I I understand it. They're still great movies, but for someone who's into that world, there was there was nothing like it. You know, like there was no there's nothing to hold on to. Well, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this. He said that all the tech guys, you know, the the, the Bill Gates and his generation of guys, were all born around the same time too because mm -hmm. circumstances were correct to create these guys at that exact moment right. it's like they had gone to five years earlier it yeah. happened yeah and it's the same with music as well isn't it you just you come along at the right time or someone else will you know? i i agree i and i'm a music like sort of like to me nothing after like 1988 i'm not i don't know anything after that like i yeah. i don't really i'm not interested <laughs> Well, it's, very sad. Said, it's, it's your childhood, isn't it? You basically, your teen years and your childhood is the only stuff you're really interested in for the rest of your life. You know, yeah, you're of kind music. of, you just stop, you, you get, I guess you, some people I think are probably better than, than me. Like they, they continue to grow and learn. Yeah. Uh, after about 17, I was just done. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's funny that's exclusive to music because artwork, it's not like that. You know, you keep looking in movies, you keep looking at yeah, directors. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. mu music almost has this cutoff with people, doesn't it? That they absolutely they, yeah. have memories uh, of being young with it. You know? I, I I think artwork is interesting in that, you know, you look at something from like 300 years ago and it can, number one, still teach you something about what you're doing right then. Mm -hmm. And you can look at something that just got pulled off of press that yeah. day. Yeah. And it does the exact same thing. You see something you've never seen before. And it, you you learn and you, it sparks interest and it rekindles your your passion for the for the the industry. I don't know about music. I'm not a musician, so yeah. I mean I, I goof around on on guitar and stuff, but I'm not like Brian. I can't. Comp I'm not a, like an, a musician like that. Oh, you know Brian's like a conductor and everything as well. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. I mean, I mean, I I went into his house first time we met 25, 24 years ago. I remember going to his house, and it was before he got married, so the house was impeccable, you know, like a, a wealthy yes. single guy's piano, house. Yeah. It was like Bruce Wayne. Everything's yes. in its place. All the comic books were alphabetical. All the CDs yes. were Way alphabetical. Way too much free time, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and he can play any instrument. He could sit down. He, he had a big grand piano in his living room, and he knocked out, like, the Star Wars theme or something, or the Star Trek Yeah, theme we, he, played for me, you know? he made us an amazing dinner one night, uh, uh, we had way too much wine and we all just started goofing off and he started playing not the grand he just had a small piano now but yeah, yeah he's just he just sits down and starts doing it was that in england or was that over in california yeah that was uh we had gone over for a trip and we had missed a train or something to get back to paris right and brian we just called him brian up and what are you doing okay so we got we went and got uh way too uh intoxicated and then we just crashed back at his place I didn't know. When was that? When were you in, when were you in England? This must have been when we were living in Paris. 
Right. So we were, we had, we'd gone over to London for something. I can't even remember. And so this was back in 2000, probably. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. So th that's that time, I guess. Brian's just exploding, you know, and, and you, mm -hmm. you're the guy. I mean, this is why I'm so happy we have a book out. This should be on the same day we bring the book out, the Ambassadors Issue 3. Like, you're the guy who every artist keeps on their desk. You know, there's a few guys who people keep on their desk. I know you're, you're it's embarrassed. It's very nice of you to say it. It's very nice But you've got, like, you know, you, Frank Quitely, Coy Pell, you know, Brian Hitch. You know, there's a few guys who artists keep around. And even if they hate the stories or whatever, you know, they keep the art, don't they? You know, and oh, like yeah, yeah. the pages and everything. And in the previous generation, the guys like that was Frazetta, Toth, mm -hmm. you know, Gil Kane. Like, they're really brilliant, brilliant artists. And you've, you're just one of those guys. But what blew my mind is I assumed you were some like long time comic fan because you're so idolized by comic book fans and comic artists and I mean especially artists. Um but you didn't grow up with American comics, which amazed me because you're Canadian. You know? No, um part part of it is uh, it's funny that now you're like a you're a gentleman farmer now. <laughs> I almost think you should start your own Netflix show like Clarkson has on Prime. <laughs> I love that show you want on to, your yeah. farm. You watch Clarkson's <laughs> farm, yeah. I've watched it, yeah. He's a He's interesting, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I, I always think he's going to have a heart attack. He always looked very, he always looks ill, right? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> and so, but when I was a kid, I grew up in a very small town in northern Alberta, in yeah. Canada. Uh, spent most of my summers on farms, you know, and we, you know, we were uh, just plain to say we were not wealthy, like comics, even just comics, we would have to go into a city to buy them and then yeah. you know it was almost a luxury to have them yeah so anything i had was second hand so it passed down from uncles or friends or something like that so it was very hard to build a, a hobby that way sure yeah but your, your mom and dad were artists they weren't, how, what were you doing on a farm what were you doing my on? grandfather ran a dairy farm and we basically the whole family like there was 30 people yeah living in in this at this farm half yeah. of the time so I, I have six, six dairy cows. It's like, it's the worst. Because you can't do anything. Oh, you yeah, got to melt them in the morning and melt them in the evening. You know, it's like, you can't. Yeah, you got to be up. Before, and in, in Canada, yeah. in January, you still have to go milk the cows, right? So it's, yeah, it's brutal. So do you do you know your way around a farm? Do you know tra your tractors and all this kind of stuff? Not, I mean, I would say the last time I was, because they sold the farm. It's, it's all yeah. gone now. Uh, probably like I was 11 or 12 the last time I was on the farm. Could you identify a Massey Ferguson from a Eastern European Zeta? I don't know. My <laughs> grandfather's stuff was so bad and so <laughs> ill repaired, and uh, <laughs> but uh, we all had to learn how to do the stuff. Like we, like we all had to learn how to, you know, basically butcher animals and yeah. pluck chickens and stuff like that. We, you know, as a kid, you had to learn to do all this stuff, and you had to, you it couldn't be squeamish. My wife, that's how she grew up. Her parents are farmers, and yeah. she, she's a trained butcher, although she's this lovely person and everything. <laughs> she she well, looks at people like they're pieces of meat, you know, that she can just take yeah. apart, you know. So, so you, you can take apart a cow then, yeah? No, no, no. I, 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 I do not know the technicalities of how to do something, but yeah. I, yeah. but I was, you know, I, I did all the gross stuff that you had to do on a farm, you know, like all the, the things that nobody talks about, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just leave it at that. Let's just Yeah, yeah. The stuff that you don't see on uh like uh all creatures great and small, the stuff that you don't see on that show is is what I got to see. <laughs> so are you friendly with Stuart Eminem? Because I know he's another kid who grew up in the Indian farm. I think I've spoke and I've never spoken to him, I've never met him. And yeah. I think we had a one email between us. Right. But he's another one of these guys who's really good. Yeah. Um can do 10 different things, yeah. right? Like if you want him to be sort of whimsical, he'll yeah. do that. If you want him to be dark, he'll do that. He's mm -hmm. And he's relatively quick. Like, yeah. oh, I yeah. don't know if he's Brian Hitch quick, but he's pretty quick. He's about the same. He's about five pages a week. You know? That's that's impressive, yeah, that yeah. he can do that and still be uh, as good as he is, yeah. And he's inking himself as well. I mean, that's an inking. Yeah, yeah. And he's got the, and I believe his, uh, is it his wife who colors him? I, I don't know actually. I know they write together sometimes, but I'm not. Okay, she writes with him. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't. Rochelle has no interest in ever 
working with me. <laughs> I think Sorry? she personally resents the idea that I get to stay home. Because <laughs> Rochelle was my editor, like I said, when I was at Wildstorm, but I, yeah. I, I knew you guys were dating. And it's a bit like, you know, Brad and Angelina back in the day and everything. There's those comic, oh. <laughs> big, those, those comic <laughs> big power couples, you know? But yeah, I, yeah, I, we're so, yeah, we're powerful. Yeah. How, we how can barely get happen? our daughter to do her homework, yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you can see yeah. the area here, that's, I share a studio with my daughter. Oh, that's cool. So she has that little area there. And then I'm, that's where I do my, like my manual labor, like my yeah. painting and my pencil drawing. And I'm right now I'm sat in front of uh, a big tablet with a, a screen in front of me. So here's where I do all my prep work, like my pencils. I do it all on a big tablet. I love looking around somebody's studio. It's my favorite thing. I mean, I love to see their pencils. I love to see what ink they're using. I love to see oh, yeah, yeah. they're listening to and everything. And you know, there's this book. I mean, I don't have it, but I've heard this legendary book is out there. And it's a big, thick book of photographs of comic book artists' studios. Have you, have you ever seen this thing? I I know the book you're talking about. I don't know the name of it, but it, I remember the first time I, uh, there's this uh, Japanese painter called Soriyama. Yeah. And for years and years and years, I would look at his stuff and I'd be, I couldn't figure out how he did stuff. Like yeah. I, I, I would... I would copy it, zoom in, and how does it, how is he doing this? And then I saw one picture of him in a Japanese uh, art magazine, and he had all these airbrushes there. I'm like, it it like <laughs> I still couldn't do what he could do, yeah. but I, it literally unlocked so much stuff. Oh, okay, like of course, you know, right? So because if you don't know about something, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like I didn't know about an airbrush or you know how to do all that stuff. So yeah. It's amazing how much you can unlock by yeah. looking at what an artist uses, the tools. Yeah. And it's inspirational, isn't it? Not just to see what they can do, but the idea that it's human beings who do this stuff, isn't it? You know that moment when mm -hmm. you realize it's not machines and it's not people yeah. who are terribly far away. It was inspirational for me to see the British creators coming in. Was, was that what it was like for you? I mean, because comics is a weird choice for somebody who didn't grow up with comics. Like, what inspired you to think, oh, this could be a career for me? Then? Well, I could, I, apparently I could always draw a little bit when I was, you know, I've been told by aunts and uncles, you know, yeah. that I was always drawing, but they say that about every kid, right? Like yeah. every kid draws a lot. Um, it's, it's weird, but, uh, I had, I had the same conversation with, uh, another artist who grew up in similar cir circumstances as me, mm -hmm. didn't have access to comic books. And we both ended up doing the same thing. Anytime we saw, um, like illustrations anywhere, we would, you know, uh, start looking for them. Like we would literally look at the phone book. Yeah. Looking, I, I don't know if you have this over there, but there's illustrations for like plumbers or handymen or something, or some guy yeah. with a wrench or something. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff we would, that's how we learned was any, you know, advertisements or on boxes of a cereal. Yeah. That's what, anything that was illustrated. That's how we learned yeah. until we had access to books like that. So I was constantly, you know, and then when, when you could watch cartoons, you know, all my drawings started looking like whatever cartoon I was watching. Right. So just like you hear from so many artists, we're just sponges, right? Everything just yeah. comes in and then we filter it through our, our own sensibilities and what comes out is our stuff. Do you know a lot of those um, yellow pages kind of ads? Yeah. Copied from comic book panels in Scotland. It was really weird, like in the 1980s. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I saw an advert for, um, you, you know what blinds are? You know, like, I, I don't know if they call them this in the States, like Venetian blinds where yes, on a yeah. window, you know, you have blinds. Yep. They had an advert for blinds. That they took a panel from Dave Gibbons and Watchmen, right? <laughs> and, it's, it's, and I still have them somewhere. I sent it to Dave. And the kit, it was in the yellow pages for like 10 years. And yeah. it was Night Owl and his secret identity, Dan Dryberg, you know, looking rounds at uh, Silk Spectre. And he's touching these blinds that they've drawn badly in the background, right? And he says, yeah. these are really great blinds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny, yeah, how they, they and I mean, like a like an artist would look at that and be like, wow, that the guy is really well drawn, but they he totally blew those blinds. Like he should have <laughs> yes. the picture or something. So. Yeah, but you have no idea. My favorite one ever was there's a, a storage company that uses Frank Miller from Sin City, right? And it's, ah. you know, sometimes they've used the wrong drawing as well. And, they, and yes. this is a big company. And it's it's um, th that yellow bastard. It's the that yellow bastard thing. Mm -hmm. So the storage company's thing is all yellow and black and everything. They use the exact same fonts and everything. 
but it's just for storage. But it's really violent looking. It looks really unpleasant. Like you would never, you would never hire these guys. You know? <laughs> it it makes you wonder who are the people. Like it's like, is it? Are they doing a bit of like a piss take? The guy like in the marketing department at the company, <laughs> or is it just somebody? who has no idea because it's got to be one or the other right like somebody who's very aware yeah or the other way like i these are small enough, you know they're, they're small yeah. enough that i think it's just somebody's dad you know yeah. somebody's <laughs> brother you know like the i don't know if in the states they have these things we're on the side of ice cream trucks yeah. and here they will always draw cartoon characters to kind of lure yeah. kids to come and get the stuff and my pal's dad used to always draw on the side of the trucks he was the the painter that they used to hire yeah. every year they did a new one and Superman Aces, I remember when I was seven, it was Superman mm -hmm. painted on the side of it, but, you know, nobody got authorization or anything. No, no, of course. Yeah. And, and I talked him into 1978 when I was eight, I talked him into doing Blade Aces. He he said to me, you know, Blade the Vampire Hunter. Yeah. And he said to me, what are kids into now? And I said, well, Superman's kind of been and gone. This is before the Superman movie came out. Yeah. And I said, Blade is the thing all the kids are into. <laughs> so, for, so for one year, Gene Colan's Blade was on the side of an ice cream truck in Scotland. It was amazing. That is weird. It, and isn't that like weird that. that Superman was out of favor, like out of fashion? Yeah. That that's mind blowing. Well, somebody and told me in 1974 DC were going to sell Superman. There was a moment where they were going to sell. Unbelievable. Yeah. To have that character yeah. handled that badly. That's yeah. that's amazing. And yet, you know, the Lone Ranger, Tarzan, these things are the biggest mm -hmm. things in the world. You know, Tar yeah. Tarzan was the biggest thing in the world. And yeah. now no kid really knows who Tarzan is. I mean, you have to be 30 plus really to know Tarzan, I think, probably not. Yeah, there's books that I loved when, you know, like, uh, and it's not even that. Like, I remember when I was a kid, some of the biggest comics were Richie Rich, mm -hmm. Casper. Yeah. They don't make that anymore for, I mean, maybe for little tiny, you know, for, for like children's books. But yeah. I was reading them. I would read a Green Lantern mm -hmm. and then read like Casper. Right. Yeah. Like, and I was as interested in both. Right. Yeah. And I thought the artwork is, was as interesting yes. in both. So what were you reading? You know, when, if you've got this limited supply of comic books in the 70s and 80s, what, what were you picking up? Oh, like I said, anything that was left over, like I had an uncle, I had cousins, mm -hmm. you know, anything that they had a pile of, mm -hmm. I would look through. And oddly enough, a lot of really good artwork was in magazines. I had no interest. I had no business having at my age right like like they used to actually pay really good illustrators to do some of the stuff in men's you know well, like pornography. <laughs> right i was going to joke like, saying pornography but actually pornography then. yeah yeah like some of like in like you you know when you're a kid you're look you you're bypassing all this stuff that the your dad wants to look at and you're like oh wow that that is a fantastic you know pinup of this this girl right <laughs> And just just from a purely artistic, you know, mindset there. That sounds but, like, that sounds like something you'd say to your teacher when you're caught with pornography in your bag. I don't know that. Yeah, so the story. articles, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and like, I mean, to to make that jump then, because the, I, I could be wrong, but the first time I was aware of you was the Flash annual that you did. You know, yeah, the, um, that was almost the first thing I ever did. I was, I uh, I I think I got in back in the. 90s i probably got in how, how a lot of people got in i yeah. i essentially just mailed samples to marvel and dc um they i got hired over the phone mm -hmm. you know I, I was still up in canada i had never had a meeting or anything and they sent me a little five page thing to do a yeah. little tryout story that went okay then they gave me a, a slightly longer story and from that then i got that that flash book yeah now, I remember, was that book maybe 93, 30 years ago? I remember being in a comic store the day that came out. You, you know, I don't know if you did, but I used to hang around comic stores. It was kind of like mall rats, but we're inside one store, you know? Like, I had, yeah. The funny thing is, I had never been in a comic store until I had a comic of mine to go into it to buy. I had That's never amazing. been in one. That, so that was weird, yeah. That's like never playing in a, you know, never going to a concert until you're playing on stage, isn't it? I mean, yeah, that's, right, that's right yeah. Thing, right? We and just I didn't, remember seeing didn't have them where I lived, yeah. That that flash annual, I remember my friend who owned the store said to me, I need to show you something. And you're like a kid, you know. You're <laughs> Is this up in Scotland? Yeah, yeah. And he took me to the back of the store and he said, look at this. And everybody was talking about it. It was really weird because 
I think artists usually take you know a couple of years to find their feet. It's that ten thousand hours thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. stuff's a little crude at first, but then there's a couple of guys who just blew up really fast. Like Jim Lee blew up really fast, mm -hmm. and and you could tell right away there was something there. And that Flash annual was the same. But it was interesting because you had a Jim Lee vibe then. There was a slight Jim Lee to your oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I was completely So when did you become aware of yeah, Jim? Absolutely. You know, like, yeah. you know, as somebody who wasn't really reading comics, when did Jim come on your radar or Mark Silvestri or any of those type of illustrators? I was, uh, the whole reason I got into comics was sort of to get out of the crappy job that I had at the time. Yeah. I was working in a plumbing wholesaler, delivering pipe and toilets to, to job sites. And a friend of mine, who's oddly enough, his name was Art, right. that was his name. At lunchtime, he would go to the, a comic book shop a couple blocks away, yeah. get comics and bring them back and read them during lunch. And mm -hmm. one day I said, can I take a look at some of your comics? Mm -hmm. And he handed them to me and they just happened to be Jim's Uncanny X-Men, one, right. one of them. Yeah. And I looked at that one. And first of all, I was like, this is really good. And then I looked at some of the other ones he had, and this is going to make me sound I, I'm almost hesitant to say this, and I did not say this about Jim stuff, but I looked at some of the comic books and I went, I, I can draw as good as this guy. Why am I working here? Yeah. And now the truth is I couldn't draw as well as this guy did, but in my 19 year old bravado, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you think you can do anything. I immediately went home drew some sample pages mailed i literally just took the addresses from the backs of the comic books that he yeah. borrowed that he lent me yeah sent them in silence crickets nothing nobody called nobody they didn't even call to tell me that they threw them in the garbage spent a year practicing like drawing every day basically didn't have a life outside of work yeah. resent samples in and that's when i got hired so right right that's how it happened yeah and were you familiar with the comic form then because you know you're you're I always think people who try and do comics who aren't familiar with comics really struggle. Like we, we oh, I, yeah, I mean, I was, thing. I would do everything. My first samples were, you know, how the, the whole Z pattern, right. That you're supposed to do. I, I didn't know anything about that. I, yeah. I'm sure I had panels stacked wrong. Yeah. It was, you know, I was doing all my own lettering on these sample pages. Yeah. Every mistake that a person could make, I I'm positive. I was making, so it is, I am lucky in the fact that in the early 90s, there was a big rush. It was like a gold rush yeah. for artists back then. I don't know if I would get hired today in with the the industry being so much smaller, mm -hmm. right? You, If you had a pulse and could hold a pencil in yeah. 1993 or four, you might get a job, you know, at least for a tryout, right? So. Oh, people's friends were getting hired? I had buddies of mine who were, who became inkers just because, <laughs> They were like, oh, can can I ink one page? And they, you know, because they just needed warm bodies. Yeah. Right? And it, it was like a production line, wasn't it? There was 200 books a month coming out from Marvel, I think, at one point. There was alone. so much money to be made. You were losing money by just not churning out stuff. Yeah. Right? Like you could, and you just slap a number one on it. You'd sell 350,000 copies. Next week, you just put on another number one. Yeah. Right? So the, the, it was a factory. Absolutely, yeah. And from there, though, I remember you doing Dark Stars because to me, you, you just seemed like a superstar immediately. And Dark Stars seemed a weird project for you. I thought, why is this guy not on Justice League or X Men or something? You know, it was a. How I, was, did that I was so happy to get the gig, but I yeah. hated every second of it because the costume was so dumb. Yeah. Like the. It took, it took me so long. I. I it, it's kind of the same thing happened with uh, ambassadors. The first time I draw a character is the worst time I'll ever draw that character because you don't know the geography of their their suit and their yeah. you know their body. You know you you have to draw it a bunch of times before you get used to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I the costume that they that they designed for this character I had no input in, mm -hmm. and so everything I, I hated about costumes, I had to draw on that thing. You know, everything right. was skin tight, so I couldn't hide all my anatomy mistakes <laughs> with, you know, capes and stuff. Yeah. They had these weird things on their shoulders that were like a chandelier or something, and <laughs> it took forever to draw. And But I was so happy to, to be working in comic books that I basically, uh, and also my page rate was so low, I, 
all I did all day was just draw like that. That was it. So I think just doing that make makes you better, right? When when yeah. you get to draw all the time, you just you grind out all the mistakes that, that are inside you. Yeah. Well, that's that ten thousand hours thing, isn't it? Is the the idea that you you learn a skill by working ten thousand hours at it, and then you're accomplished by the end of it. You know. But but you you seem to move pretty fast, like Jim. You know, you seem to improve at this weird kind of Borg like speed. You know, you you just learn quickly. Is that? I th I think I, if I could say, I think I had a decent idea. I did not know how to render. You know, like how, like a lot of inkers. I didn't know I was using ballpoint pens. I think my biggest, uh, uh sort of, uh downside back then was technique i had i did not have i did not know how to i didn't know what materials to use or what pens i didn't know anything about yeah. a brush or a quill i didn't know any of that stuff and i think if i had just had like maybe two classes with some guy who knew what he was doing it, it could have helped me you know for the next 10 years yeah so but i i could pencil so that so that's you know that saved me was yeah. was being able to to pencil. And was your phone ringing off the hook? You know, back when people had no, phones, no? it wasn't. No, no. I, I thought never, that. Man, I think I think I got pegged very early on as not like deadline guy. Like, <laughs> and I think that just uh, I think it's just and it my it's it's my own fault. You know, right. I I can't blame anybody for it. I've 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 never been a, a fast artist, and it's just kind of. It's just kind of stuck to me. So I've never been, I've never been courted. Hmm. You're probably the, you're probably the, the first guy in the last 10 years who's ever like courted me, right? Like I'd love to do a book with you. I have never been offered a book from DC or Marvel. I think it's about like one of my friends, right? She's like a, an actress and a model and guys never ask her out. She's still single, right? <laughs> And I think it's a bit like that where they think, well, I couldn't possibly oh, no, 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 this no, person that's no. probably a No, bit I think it's they literally, they, I mean, you, you know how, if it wasn't you putting this book together, can you imagine, like, the, 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 first of all, out of all this, all six artists that you, that you pulled together, yeah. can you tell me who took the longest? Because oh, I'm you? pretty sure it was me. Obviously, yeah, you know, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, we've answered our own question here. So, <laughs> yeah, but I, you had, everybody has ridiculous. their own little quirks, though. Like Frank Quietly was going to be slow as well, right? And 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 he really loves coloring his own stuff now. You know, he's yeah. working with his son, but his son lives in his house, right? So he can really keep an eye on the coloring and everything. So, so I knew he was going to be slow. I knew you were going to be potentially very slow, right? Yes. I, I started putting this book together like 2018, 2019, when I put the concept of the, the show together. <clears throat> and um, so I knew there was a couple of guys I didn't have to worry about. Matteo Scalera, two pages yeah. a day, you know. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's like he's done cocaine or something, you know. Matteo Bufagni's tricky. Yeah. Matteo Bufagni, you don't know what's going to happen. He's, he's not quite you and... Frank quietly, you know, but he's kind of, he's going to be slow. I know oh, he maybe needs three to four it's months. Spectacular. Oh, it's spectacular. It's amazing. He's brilliant, you know. But yeah. I based everyone around you. You were the watch that we all, we all, we all set our watches. Oh, that was almost clock. a very big mistake. <laughs> we got, we got pretty close to the wire too, didn't we? We did. I, I said, um, this book will come out when Travis is on page 19 oh geez you know we'll we'll, we'll 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 put the schedule together properly when he's on page 19 and everybody i made the mistake of letting some of them know that and they relaxed as well you know so there was that oh no too, you know, so, which i should have known you know because artists will always take as long as they've got you know um, so did anybody at, at the miller world offices ever tap you on the shoulder and say mark we have we made a terrible mistake uh <laughs> No, because from one page coming in, you know it's special. You know this book just looks special. I remember the first page coming through, and I was so happy. I still, I get there's two things that really excite me, right, with with work. One is when the when the email comes in with a JPEG, and sometimes you would send two at once. Yeah, three at once, even once, I think you know. And yeah, like I mean, what a morning. miracle that was! Yeah, <laughs> but it really is like Christmas morning, you know. And then when the package comes in, and I was so excited, I put a video up. 
me opening the package. Yeah, I, I saw that. Cut yeah. my fingers off. You know that. I was, yes, I yes. was so excited to see it. But uh, Olivia Coypel is another one. He's a he's a fascinating guy. I love Olivia. I'm going to try and get him on the next one. He's one of the greatest artists in the world, right? I mean, I I love Olivia's stuff. Um, but Olivia's got the funniest thing where he just disappears, right? Like you just you hear nothing, and. Like Frank Whiteley, he's pretty good. He'll be like, "Nah, I'm, I'll be another couple of weeks. I'll be another six months, or whatever." Olivia just goes to ground. You hear nothing, and then twenty-four pages show up. You're like, "What?" You know, like so. I you couldn't can, do he's that. Like I the, would be. It's like dealing with the Joker. You don't know what's coming yeah, with Olivia. Yeah. I would worry that, like, if I, if let's say, for example, I had not contacted you, yeah, and handed you all, I think it's twenty-six pages, yeah, and when I handed you to the last page. I think you would have just assumed I was dead or something like <laughs> I mean, there's no way that I could have done that. So, But, you know, Scott Dunbear uh, and I worked together years ago when I was at Wellstorm, who you know well too, you know, from your Wellstorm days. And I, he told me, I was out for dinner with him when I was working on The Authority. And he told me about your process. And he said it's amazing because obviously, like Frank Quietly, like all great artists, Brian Hitch, your first instinct is correct. You know exactly what you're doing. There's nothing to worry about. But you're tough on yourself, and you were you wouldn't be happy, and you'd rip up brilliant pages and then just start again. You know. And oh, it, it, that's the one nice thing about being digital is that yeah. does not happen anymore. Uh, <laughs> you can. It's so much easier to find a mistake before you've passed the point of no return now because you can resize things and you can flip things around. Yeah. And you can see all the mistakes you've made before you get too far down the road. Um, yeah, w when I was just working pencil on board, yeah, you know, you I, and then, and part of the problem is is you you start drawing something, you're like, oh, I, I really like that eyebrow or something, yeah. yeah, and you fall in love with a bit of your drawing, and the rest of it, the rest of the whole page, has to fit that little bit that you like, and it's yeah. the worst mistake you can make. And it doesn't happen digitally because it's so easy to, to tweak stuff in process. Well, so. So, somebody said to me, your trash can would be like the greatest collection of artwork anyone's. Oh. You know, like there's all these Every, ripped up great pages. I, I think that's been, I think I, I think my, I think I ripped up maybe two pages, but they weren't, we're talking about something that maybe had a panel's worth of pencils on it or something. Yeah. So I think that's been very exaggerated. But yes, I I have just, and I'm sure there are other artists who have just screwed yeah. it. They, they just erase it from their hard drive, right? So. Yeah. But there's three apocryphal stories about you, and that's one of them, right? That's one, <laughs> there's uh, there. amazing pages that no one will ever see, you know? Yeah, and I've the heard. Other, the other yeah. one I heard, and I don't know if this is true, is that you don't lay out. Right, and you have it in your head, and you're like an Epsom, one of those old inkjet <laughs> printers, and you start drawing in the top left hand corner, and the whole thing just comes together. As you is, is there any truth to that? Like you, you'll start with a finger in the top left hand corner, and then draw down from the finger, or a boot in the bottom say, right hand corner. Is that true? There is a small nugget of truth to that, in that I have done pages that way, but my yeah. guess is that whatever page that was was probably. Yeah not a good page but i i i am completely bored by like laying out does not excite me or interest me i like especially if it's a, a figure i really like just getting right into the and i hate doing backgrounds so if you if i'm going to lay something out it means i have to put backgrounds in and right away and but even i also feel, you know do, do, do you know do you not even do a very loose pencil sketch before you start really drawing oh no and that's that's the other thing about doing something digitally is that if i'm if for example a page like uh um like the train station in ambassadors yeah uh, not the train station but the the part where they come down and you see the massive headquarters that they have yeah the, the wonderful thing now is because you because I'm working digitally there's so much I use so much reference in that book because I was just like I'm not gonna try to draw half of this out of my head this is crazy yeah. and so it was so nice to be able to basically there's so many ways you can cheat mm -hmm. is you just find a picture of something that is like 50 percent of what you want right yeah. it has the kind of the geometry and the 
and you could just stick that in as a layer, put it at like 20% so you can barely see it. And then it, it just frees your mind to just put the characters like toys yeah. wherever you want them and put props where you ever want them. But you have this sort of like, uh, like it's like a pizza and then you put the toppings on it, right? Yeah. You don't care about the, the dough. And so it, that, that definitely helped me lay things out is, is, is being able to use things like reference and uh, um, like just using like layers where I can just do a very faint layer of something and then I can just, just leave it there in the background and I don't have to think about it. And then I can go in and do what I like doing, which is characters and rendering and form and, and details and stuff. So in your paper in ink days, were you doing that with lightboxing? Were you? Uh... I have a light box. I hated using it. I hated yeah. the whole process. Yeah, I didn't like it. Um, I, I've tried every way you can. I've tried projectors, um, mm -hmm. light boxes, you know, tracing paper. I, yeah. I would try them and then just abandon them. I hated the process of it, yeah. You know, I'm actually not a fan of environment in art anyway. You know, like I'm I'm much more interested. I mean, think of it in a movie terms, right? You're more interested in the actors than you are in the scenery, the backdrop, aren't you? you know? So I like a good establishing shot, which you do. Jay Lee does this as well. You know, you'll get a great establishing shot and then you let the characters act, which I, yeah. I really like. Is that the way you approach the page then, really? Yeah. This, I mean, part, I mean, it's partly your fault, but <laughs> the, this book, I wanted it to feel... Like I really, I didn't want to have characters just in a room with, you know, a, a wall. Yeah. I really wanted for the first time to have a setting, right? Yeah. Because it was so yeah. specifically Paris. Yes, that's I true. I wanted yeah. the book yeah. to feel like it Good was friend. in Paris. And I, I really wanted people to look at this book and be like, you know, this is not New York City. This is yeah. not, yeah. you know, he didn't, you know, this isn't like a, every everything that's in there. Mm -hmm. Every reference I used in the book was... French somewhere, yes. from somewhere yeah. in France. So yeah. I really wanted it to feel that way. I, and that's your... say it's the most background you've probably ever drawn. Like I I, I can't oh, absolutely. Think of... Absolutely, yeah. Every yeah. panel is a different angle on Paris, really, isn't it? Like I would literally like uh for a lot of the stuff with Paris, I would go to like Google Earth <laughs> and I would because you can make it look 3D and I would find an angle I liked. I would do yeah. a screenshot and then I had this, you know, I could just stick it low res in the background yeah. and then just build on top of it and put the characters and put other buildings on top of it. And, yeah. you know, it was just such like a nice little touchstone, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't know anything about Paris, they might not know, but somebody from Paris, they might see things, you know, they might appreciate the effort, right? Well, now with an international audience, you know, especially online. Absolutely, yeah. Like, it's a nightmare to get something wrong, isn't it? So that's why every every page, every line of dialogue, I ran past, past French friends. You know Thomas Astruc, yeah. the guy who, who does uh, Miraculous, you know, the Miraculous cartoon? I've heard the name before, yes. Lady, Ladybug and Cat Noir. Um, so I had him look at every page, you know, like, and he, he, I mean, he's so excited about it. He loves your stuff and everything as well. So it's, it's great. Because I don't want to go to France and people mock it, you know, so I'm, I'm pleased it works, you know. So if so, you're so um, this is uh, this book is being. I don't know if I'm talking out of school, but I'm I'm assuming this book is going to be one of the series that Netflix is going to be making. Our plan is what they do is they bought they bought Miller World uh, back in 2017, and they got 17 franchises, I think, with Miller World when they bought it. Um, not Kingsman and Kickass, which I still own, but they got 17 things like Chrononauts, Reborn, you know, all, all all these things you've seen. But then they, I have to. Uh, part of the deal was they got me for a really long time to create new franchises in-house. So Ambassadors is one of the new franchises that are created that we're going to turn into something. Now, the idea is a series of movies that each spin off into their own individual TV shows. So when something's popular, you know, like if something becomes a Wolverine, it spins off into yeah. a sort of thing. Uh, but they, they, all, they all have a different, really different flavor. It was really hard to do because I wanted each one to be able to stand in its own. It couldn't just be generic team with you know where the fifth character wasn't as important as the first character because that character might have his own show so i had we had to really think through the dynamics of every character so the french one you know the the two the mother and son and, and the french comic they could be their own show there's like uh there's a real depth to them and mm -hmm. the characters are very defined and their environment is super defined you know so it's a lot of work you know but more, more work for you than me though i think yeah 
<laughs> I was thinking about this yesterday, like the like the the joke about, you know, the the writer writes, you know, the the hero crests a hill and he sees the entire English army right now. I'm like, yeah, okay. That's six seconds of of your work and then yeah. the right the artist is just Okay, that's my that's that's September sorted out. So, <laughs> so okay. yes, yeah. Did I write in this script at any point? This has to be the greatest page you've ever drawn, or something. Did I write that in any of the descriptions? I think in some of the earlier pages. Yeah. Because you're very exuberant in your emails, like you're very like, you know, like this is gonna be, and it is nice. Like it, I've I've worked with with writers who are, I wouldn't say they're kind of dry, yeah. right? Their scripts are kind of dry. It's very, you know, this is what happens, but there's, there's none of that sort of underlying, wow, this is exciting. I can't wait to see it, that kind of yeah. stuff. And so, but I would say that as, as the output maybe didn't match up with maybe what you were expecting, I think your, your enthusiasm did not wane. However, you were, you had lots of other things happening at the same time and so yeah. i definitely saw that you were not not less enthusiastic but perhaps like like you, i wasn't getting the pep talk <laughs> like the first few pages like this is going to be so great but you were always so kind and so i i don't think in this whole process i ever got a single email with you being like where the f are my pages <laughs> i remember when i was working <laughs> On the Flash Annual, yeah. uh, Neil Posner, rest in peace, he calls me up because we did everything over the phone, right? So I, if I didn't, if I was late, I just let it go. And this is back when we had the, the thing with the cassette, yeah. right? This wasn't even like a digital phone. So I would just let everything go to the answering machine. And I remember, and then I would, at night, I would get my guts up enough to listen to all the messages. And one of them was Neil Posner. Am, am I allowed to swear on on Board? this thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Compulsive? And he says, if you don't have those pages in by Monday, you can fucking eat them. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so I, you know, like I would get, and you never told me to, to eat the pages. So it was, I'm very. I think good artwork takes time. Like, I mean, so many people say to me, oh, this guy's amazing. Andy can draw 15 pages a week. And I was like. That's not that's not true, you know. Like, how, you, yeah, how is that possible? Time, you know, like, and and if it takes three or four years, it takes three or four years. That's that's the way I look at it. You know, that uh, if I almost like I know people are when this book comes out, this is kind of like my life now. I know I'm going to be sitting behind a table, and someone's going to hand me a copy, and they're going to I'm going to I'm going to sign it for them, and they're going to go. How long did that take? <laughs> and I'm going to have to do the, the instant calculation inside my head. Like, do I tell them exactly how long it took? Because <laughs> that's going to be that's, the next five minutes are going to be kind of an embarrassing conversation. Or do I kind of shave six months off? Or I don't know. Or I just say it took a long time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I've I've had those many of those conversations. And there are a few animals out there, you know, who are just like. They're amazing. They're fast and they're brilliant, you know, especially early in your career, in your 20s, you know, guys will do all-nighters. Like Johnny Romita, who's always amazing. You know, Johnny turned in 24 pages of Spider-Man between a Friday and a Monday one time. He did a, he didn't sleep for a whole weekend. He did 24 pages over the weekend, you know. But these beasts are rare, I think. And that's the other thing I is, I mean, we're both in our 50s now. Yeah. I would, it would literally, if I tried to, to do an all-nighter, now i feel terrible for three days right to me an old nighter is 11 o'clock yeah i i can i do not have the physical abilities yeah. to to be up all night like i did in my 20s absolutely not yeah I, it, was, it was so unhealthy i'm so curious about your day because like the guys who are the workhorse guys you know those guys who do sort of okay art you know but they're sitting there six days a week and they're there from morning till night time <clears throat> I, I know what's taking the time because i can see it they're, they're sitting drawing but somebody like you and Vin to some extent, you know, Frank quietly to some extent, like you take a long time to do a page, you know, but are you, are you sitting there? Cause Vin, you know, Frank quietly is, he's sitting at, at that desk a lot of the time. Are you sitting there or do you do other things, you know, between panels or whatever, you know, how, how does it work for you? No, I'm, if I have a, if I, 
if I've, I, I, I try to have a, uh, my daughter goes to school in the morning. Yeah. I try to be sitting down, ready to work around nine o'clock. Um, I try not to work too much at night. I, yeah. I usually end up working, you know, after dinner for a little while. You're working all day then? Yeah, you're, you're, you're not. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of what you see me when I'm working is nothing's happening. Right. Like, like I'm sitting there, the, my little stylus is in my hand, yeah. and I'm looking at the page, and there's a lot of, like, moving my head around and squinting, yeah. and I, I'm just very... I wouldn't. I, I would never call myself a perfectionist because yeah. I, I I don't know what that means, but I I I can never be. I can never just. I I do not know understand guys who can just sit down and just just go right into like the meat of it. I just I have to kind of nibble away at edges and stuff. And yeah. Yeah. sometimes I get lucky and I can really. Uh, I have a, a great take on it right away, but most of the time I'm I'm kind of dancing around and there's almost like a a nervousness, I yeah. guess I would say yeah. about, about, do I have the right idea? And, and then you trying stuff. And so there's a lot of that that goes on. And then once I start, once I have an idea, or once something's clicked, or, you know, I've, I have, you know, once, you know, sometimes you flip stuff around, and you're like, Oh, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Then it, it's much quicker. Like once I kind of get past that little, a little wall of, of sort of, I can see it now then that's when everything happens yeah have but you a lot ever tried you know to give yourself a time limit and just see what happens like i'll give you an example there was a guy who used to draw judge dread for 2000 AD when i was a kid and i met him one time and he had the most bizarre way of working right and what he did was he started drawing at nine o'clock and he gave himself a page a day and he set his alarm for five o'clock and he would draw all the figures and then he would only draw backgrounds until five o'clock and he would literally just stop drawing backgrounds at five. And then that was that page finished and he moved on to the next page, you know? So like, have you, have you ever given yourself like a day and just like, I'm going to do a page today and just see how it looks. I tried that. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the little strip thing I do that space girl thing. I'm obsessed with it. I keep it on my desk. I love it. I used to, that, that was my, my one attempt at like, uh, when I started it, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I was sick of being so slow, so ponderous. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm just going to do something and do it as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. and so I would give myself about, I think I had like a two hour time limit on those. Cause they're yeah. quite tiny. They're, they're yeah. the little physical art is only this big. Oh, you drew them the size that I asked yeah, you they're, drew those giant. Yeah. They're three those by are... eight. They're the panels are three by eight. They're, they're very small. Right. And so I would literally just, sit down and just whatever happened happened right like yeah, yeah like however bad it was that's how it ended up yeah after two hours i would stop working on it i would stop noodling on it yeah but what happened was after about six or seven of them i started liking it <laughs> oh i want this to be better so yeah, yeah but yeah so i so that is always what would happen i would set a time and then i'd be like mm, this could be this could be a little bit better so well, Hitch, Hitch, I remember when he was penciling, not inking, he had Andrew Curry or Paul Neary inking. Um, he would do maybe three pages a week when we were doing Ultimates. You know, he's faster now, but he was doing three pages a week then. And I said the same to Frank Whiteley. I said, what would happen if like a bad guy had a gun at your head, right? And they said, you have to draw four pages today. Like, how bad would those pages look? And I'm almost so curious about that because I think part of perfectionism is not trusting your instincts, isn't it? Like, like I think I I bet yeah, your first pass head, is great. You know, I could do something that looked like, like I could, I could do something that looked like a comic book, yeah. but it wouldn't be one that anybody would want to read, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that would be. <laughs> I think the fastest I've ever done a page. Yeah, I think was. I think back when we were working on Wildcats, yeah. Jim lowered the boom on us one night and we were we had to get three pages done. And I think that's the I did think I did three pages in one day. Yeah. Sort of day and night. But they were there was stat panels. Yeah. I mean it was there was it was basically just a bunch of floating heads and it was it was awful, but <laughs> it it had to go like on an airplane the next day, basically. Yeah. Right? yeah.
Listen, I'm going to talk to you about Wildcats in a second. I need to do a fast pee. I drank about a litre of Coke with the children tonight. No, no, go ahead. I'm going to go check on my... uh... It's just hit me. Through the magic of editing, we'll take this. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God, that felt fantastic. I bet. It felt so good. You know, I I needed that. So, um, So we were saying, like... I, like Jim calling you up, there's a weird thing I've noticed with my director friends, right? My director friends become really obsessed with certain actors, and I realize what those actors are are slightly younger versions of them. You know, like there's a like like Chris Nolan and DiCaprio, they kind of look kind of similar. You know, they, they wear the same kind of clothes. They always wear dark blue, and they've got their hair swept back, mm-hmm. and like uh, you know. I, I think throughout history, directors have always focused on one actor, Scorsese and De Niro, a slightly yeah. idealized version of them. And I think the same thing happens in comics too, doesn't it? Like, I think Mark Silvestri and Michael Turner, you could see the DNA, the shared DNA. Mm-hmm. And you and Jim, I think, had that as well. Like, Jim must have looked at your stuff and appreciated it. He could, he could see what you had, I think. I think um, with Jim, I think a lot of it was they when 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 wildstorm started or when homage when it was still called homage yeah. they were looking for like a house style i think yeah. almost like marvel had a house style for a while yeah and i think i i fit nicely into that house style yeah. that they had and, and so that was besides you that was that was the only other time i've ever been like officially quartered like uh in uh in a couple of days i had uh Rob Liefeld and Jim both sort of offer me a job. Yeah. And I went with Jim just because I I liked Rob, but I, I just thought I was such a fan of Jim's. I'm like, okay, yeah. I, yeah. I get to actually work with him. So, but I would definitely say that it took, I would say it took like 10 years probably to kind of to, to kind of shake off like the the Jim Lee sort of like I wouldn't call them chains or something, but yeah. it left such a huge influence on how I drew. Yeah. That I had to I had to draw very differently for a long time to get the just that just the the unconscious um, sort of aping that I was doing out of me. Yeah. And I think what what has what has happened is is that. I think it, it's now now it's nicely kind of stewed into this nice pot where you know I think if if I had like a a reference like a influence board it would probably be Jim uh, Adam Hughes uh, probably uh, Mobius and you know maybe like uh, some movie poster guys yeah and I would say that that's probably all congealed together to make whatever it is that that i do like i've I've kind of meshed all that together because i when i when i draw i can see the gym bits and i can see the atom bits i can like i know when i'm drawing something i'm like oh that's i'm drawing i'm trying to draw like adam now or i'm trying to draw like jim right now so it's all still in there do you not think that's part of being in your 20s though and being a young artist is that like the way politics for example i think we have our parents politics until we suddenly have this self-actualization, don't we? We suddenly think, hey, why do I think that? You know, it's just because my mom and dad thought that. And then you start to reason for yourself. So the same, your influences are the stuff you loved, and then you transcend the stuff you loved. Yeah. I think a lot of it is not going to art school. Mm-hmm. That was my art school, you know, looking at comic books. Yeah. So maybe if I had had, maybe if I had gone to a, like a proper art school, it might have not been that way because I would have understood why things looked the way they did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just because that's how I learned to draw was looking at a comic book artist. It, that's how it was always going to be, right? That's how I was, what my stuff was going to look like. Who is going to teach you better than the best comic book artists? You know, like Quentin Tarantino always yeah. said, I didn't go to film school. I watched a lot of yeah. great movies. And I think right. same with comic book art. Who's going to teach you better than the masters of comic book art? The guys in art school are not going to be as good. No, no, that's that's why they're teaching in art school. <laughs> but uh, I do wish that I had just I so many things I do not know how to do even to this day, like color theory, mm-hmm. you know, composition. 
there's so many things I wish I had just had like maybe a semester to learn some basics, just the nuts and bolts of, of artwork, uh, painting, just that I, I look at someone like Alex Ross and I know that number one, he can draw, but number two, he knows so much about color Yeah. that I just cannot. And he does so much with color that I can't do because I have no idea. I don't know what goes together. I don't know how to to make the emotional connection with these two colors that he can do. So I, I wish I had some kind of schooling in that way. Al Alex is a monster, isn't he? I mean, like, he was 24 when he did Marvels and 20, yeah, unbelievable. 28, 28 when he did Kingdom Come. I mean, yeah. it's insane, isn't it? It's I don't so know why. I know he is like a rock star, but like, why isn't he... I mean, I guess it's funny, like, I guess I, I guess I always expect the people that I consider heroes. Yeah. Why everybody doesn't think they're, 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 they're their heroes as well. Yeah. And I guess it's yeah. just because it's not their world. But I look at these people, and I'm like, <clears throat> you know, how, how do you walk down the street? Right. <laughs> and it's like, well, I, I draw comic books, you know. Like, yeah. But I, I love Alex, though, but I, I think for me, his, I love it when a great artist teams up with a great writer. And for me, I love Alex teams with a great writer. You know, mm -hmm. so like it becomes difficult though because he's got a lot of great ideas of his own. But I was talking to Hitch about this a few weeks ago. I think if you're a guy that's devoted your entire life to drawing, somehow in synthesis with a guy who's devoted his entire life to writing, you're going to create something special. So like he working with Mark Wade or Kurt Busiek, that's magic, isn't it? Like that was just perfect. You know, I'd mm -hmm. love to see him teaming up with, I don't know, whoever is the big guy just now, James Tinian or whatever, you know, like, I'd love to see what they would produce, you know, what would a Justice League or a Batman book be like with those two guys? You know? Yeah, such a big idea that they had. Yeah. Right? And so perfectly executed. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's difficult, you know, like, I think they would bump against each other and everything, but sometimes the best art comes from being challenged, doesn't it? It's, it's uh, you, you don't always get to do what you want. And sometimes it's only later you look back and you think that was tough, but that's why it was good. I, out of curiosity, there there were a couple times in Ambassadors where I didn't like I didn't like veer very far away from from yeah. what you had. I tried to stay pretty close, yeah. but there were a couple times when I I made different choices. Mm -hmm. And were the, was there anything that I did that you were like? No, I was worried about that actually. Because oh, you were okay. I was. I was a little bit worried <laughs> because I could tell from from books you've done in the past that you have done your own thing a little bit. And uh, and I really struggle with that. Like not to sound like a control <laughs> freak, but I, you know, the way I write my scripts is quite beat by beat. So if yes, somebody yes. messes with the Jenga of it all, the whole thing can come tumbling down. Yeah. And, it's very and, rhythmic. And Absolutely. It's, it's rhythmic. You know, like the rhythm is so important to my storytelling, but you just, it works. You know, you just, you kept it great, which I was really happy with. I remember when the double page spread came in, there was a couple of little changes around the spread and I was, Yep. until i saw the lettering and i was like no it's fine it's gonna be okay <laughs> <laughs> i would say almost 99 percent of the time when i change something yeah that a writer has written yeah it's because i i just don't want to draw that thing i don't know <laughs> i'm like oh, i don't want to draw another horse or something <laughs> So I'm not going to draw that horse. You know, what was it like working with Alan Moore and um, and Jim Robinson? Like, they're both amazing writers. And especially at that period, you know, Jim was super hot with Starman and all this kind of stuff. You know, he was a, a big a big comic book writer who, who I think really gave you a lot of cool stuff to draw, you know. I was Moore, very I'll lucky. Number was it number 21 of Wildcats, the one that you and Moore did that had that sort of Reservoir Dogs framing structure where it was jumping back and forward in time? And, probably, uh, probably around there. Yeah, probably. I, I kept it on my desk for about ten years. I genuinely kept it on my desk for about ten years because it really inspired me. I just found it so fresh. I'd never seen a comic like it, you know. But working with those guys at the peak of their powers and everything, you know, was that was it exciting, or were you just too too busy to notice how? Cool? No, um, I was. I, I being in my middle twenties, mm -hmm. I wished I had a bit more wisdom then yeah. than yeah. than I did because I was very lucky to be working with two very good writers and I had yeah. no idea of the fact that that doesn't happen a lot that you, yeah. Yeah. you, yeah. you very rarely get th that opportunity. Yeah. And I think with James, I think I did, I think I, 
how can I say I I think with James I I collaborated like more how can I say I did the, I, I did I did, I did a more like a grown-up job with James mm -hmm. with Alan I I always feel bad about the work I did with Alan I wish I could have gone back and and been smarter and really appreciated I th I don't I think I did a disservice to a lot of of what Alan wrote because I was you know stupid 25 year old and I you know I I think I had no concept of of the fact that this was going to be looked at 10 years later and I, I yeah if I could redraw all that Alan Moore stuff would stuff I would I would redraw all of it and I would I would try to do so much better with it than I than I did yeah I feel it weeping when I hear you say that like it's so good it's I feel so funny. guilty about how it went with Alan he, he was so nice too he yeah. I talked to him twice and he was such a nice guy and he's talking to this 25 year old dumbass and I just and part and then when I got to work with Jodo later mm -hmm. I really tried to you know and that didn't end well but I really tried to soak up everything that he was doing and I tried so hard to like make up for the mistakes that I made with what I think I made with Alan like just not being respectful of of his of his words right like just screwing around too much it was brilliant though you know I I know there was some sort of not great fill-in pages and things like that but the way I used to say to my friends was yeah but we've got eight pages of Travis there's still eight pages oh. of Travis in there, you know? And I would I would look at those eight pages and I'd be inspired by them. And if I was working on a script where the art wasn't that great, I'd visualize them in your style and everything. And I used to love having that stuff sitting around. So it's never it's never underappreciated, you know? I think people always like, even if you do a little, they're, they're happy to see it. Yeah, it's just, I, I've worked, I, I've worked with uh, artists, I've, I've worked with writers who I could tell were, were not invested, right? Like they, 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 it was just get the pages out, you know, just get it turn, you know, burn and churn. And how often, you know, I've got to work with James Robinson, you, Joe Dorosky, Alan Moore, like the pretty good lineup, but from me, yeah, pretty, pretty good. I mean, that's so I, it's so much there. Just think of the books that could have been made, you know, so. You know, but I, I see you as like you know John Casanel, the guy who uh, yeah. played Fredo in The Godfather. I yeah. think you're a bit like him when you look at his <laughs> when you look at his IMDb page. It's like holy, yeah, four movies. everything he's done is amazing. You yeah, know? they're all bangers. I think you, know, you yeah. haven't got a huge body of work, but every artist I know has your pages up on their wall, you know, and they have these books sitting around their desk. So, I mean that that was a big surprise for everyone because 2000s, comics were kind of being saved a little bit. American comics had been kind of not great for about five years. You know, that like the Image mm -hmm. books had come out and Image had made a lot of money and everything in the early 90s and everything. Oh. Marvel was doing brilliant early 90s. And then suddenly Marvel's filing for Chapter 11 and everything. But then about 99, 2000, you'd Warren and Brian in Authority, Warren and John Cassidy on Planetary. And these uh, Warren doing a lot of great books, actually, but like, but a, a lot of interest in people suddenly coming in. And then you took off. I was like, where's he going? You know, and you were off to Humanoids, like... At the most exciting time, what what drew you to suddenly become a European graphic album guy? Like, why did you disappear from the American scene? For a, 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 it was a partly because I think I had kind of worn out my welcome. Like, uh, I think I had kind of I had become like slow deadline blower guy, mm -hmm. and I just thought, you know, like, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm I'm not gonna. I just saw myself just getting, you know smaller and smaller jobs and mm -hmm. less pre, pre, prestigious titles, you know, like I, I knew I was not going to get a big, I, nobody was going to give me Spider-Man or mm. X-Men or anything like that. And so when the, the, the guy met, I, I met the, the person who was running humanoids at the time at the San Diego con and he pitched me, you know, you get to work with Jodo, mm -hmm. you get to work on a book that Juan Jimenez, yeah. did previously who i was a massive fan of yeah he's great yeah and i just thought this is like a clean yeah. fresh start yeah. right like i i get to i get to remake myself mm -hmm. and I, basically in a way i did but in a way i didn't because mm -hmm. i i really tried to do good work but 
didn't finish the book, right? So fell yeah, into all the same traps. Color, the color choice thing, I mean, when somebody's slow, you don't paint. You know, you don't go and paint. And it's like, I mean, how many pages a month were you drawing when you were when you were painting? Oh, my God. Uh, every bad mistake that you could do as an artist, I did on that book. I worked really big. Yeah. Oh, really? The pages were massive. What, size? what were you working at? What kind of size were you doing? I was, some of the pages were uh, in inches. They were 20 by 30. So they were, they were humongous because yeah. I wanted, I, I wanted when they uh, got reduced, I yeah. wanted the, the detail to really pop. <laughs> and I also knew that I couldn't paint, you know, really fine. So they had, yeah. everything had to be big. Yeah. And, but the thing was, I, like I said, with uh, uh, Alex Ross, I didn't know anything about color theory. Right. So the first two pages that I handed in to humanoids, the editor yeah. literally told me these colors. He said this, uh, his, his English was not great. He said, he's, these colors make my eyes bleed. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to recolor. I had to repaint the yeah. first two pages. So, I mean, I think it took me, I think when I left Paris, I had only done Oh my goodness. I think it was 29 pages of that, wasn't that 29? Oh, I did, but I think I did half of the book stateside after oh, I, I came oh, right. back because I was only in Paris for just over two years. Oh, I thought you did the whole period there. I thought you were living No, we, uh, because I was there with Rochelle. Yeah. And basically, she got too homesick. She didn't want right. to stay in France anymore because she, is, she wanted to see is her. Is she a California home. girl? Yeah, is she she from California? She's from San Jose, just basically 50 miles from here. It's where she grew up. Yeah. And so she really missed her parents. And so we we decided to come back to California, which was a whole other thing because uh, humanoids had not, in fact, uh, finished my uh, resident, my permanent residency. Yeah. And so when I got when I tried to come back into the United States, I was basically uh, sent to Vancouver. Yeah. Like they wouldn't let me enter. Yeah. So I had to spend six months in Canada waiting to re-enter the United States, waiting for them to do the paperwork. So that's crazy. So that was fun. So. The weird thing about Canadians is, I mean, they're a little bit British, they're a little bit a little European, bit, yeah. and a little bit American. So, so did that did that world feel quite normal to you? Because I I thought you fitted that so well. It's not like most American comic book artists would look weird doing a, a European album. It felt like it fitted you like a glove. You know, you didn't look weird amongst Mobius and you know, all these amazing I, guys. I grew up in a, uh, uh, the little town that I grew up in was French Canadian. So right. like all my, all my family, they all speak French. Yeah. And so they were, they had all these French albums, essentially, right. like all these French yeah. books. And so that's where I saw Mobius and, and uh, Heavy Metal. Right. It was at my uncle's house because he collected all this stuff. So I think a lot of that, I think the, my affinity for, things you know for working on the book with Jodo yeah. came from my looking at the stuff when I was a kid and it was all just because everyone spoke French so yeah was it Metal Hurland you were reading them were you reading yeah. the French version yeah. yeah is your French pretty good no no <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no I not not since I was probably about 14 or 15 could I speak French Right, I, I see behind you the Rue de Cluny uh, that's where we lived in Paris we lived on the Rue de Cluny I used to drink there. Anytime I go, yeah, to there's Paris. a bunch of bars. That's yeah, it's right across the street from Album. Yeah, yeah. The that you, big comic book store, Album, is right across yeah. the street from where we lived. Yeah. I love Album. Anytime I'm in Paris, that's where I go. You know, yeah. so like, uh, so I used to drink across the road in those pubs. Yeah. Oh, that is love, probably. I mean, I would say that is probably like two blocks of the best comic book stores. Yeah. In Europe, right there, there's like four or five of them. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Oh, that's a neat, that's a nice part of town to be living in. Yeah. Yeah, we were, yeah. we were lucky. Um, this was, I mean, the, 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 they, was that the Euro? I want to say, no, they were still on the Franc. Yeah. So it was so cheap. I mean, yeah. it was still Paris, so it was expensive, but compared to the dollar. Yeah. So we, we didn't need to, and I was so slow. So it was, we were lucky. <laughs> The only way we survived was every once in a while I would have to draw something and sell it on eBay, and that's basically how we how we lived in France. See, in this between. is the third apocryphal Travis tale, right? The, right. The, I meant to ask you this. 
I always heard that you guys were independently incredibly wealthy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so this we were is, so broke all the time. That's hilarious. No, no, no. I, I, I heard that you guys had inherited some wine fortune. This was the story I heard. Oh, and my that's God. Why you went to Paris because you guys had inherited. You know, you know these stupid stories you hear in comic stores? So there's no truth to this at all, no? Her, uh, my Rochelle's grandfather. Yeah. Uh, he owned a winery up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Right. Uh, she worked there summers. Uh, he has since passed on, and it has since been sold. Yeah. When we none of we were so stony broke when we were. I remember counting francs <laughs> before we would go into the grocery store because yeah. we could only get like this much of this garbage pate we used to get and these <laughs> this much crackers. I mean, we were. We were, that's part of the reason we came back is because we were so, so sick of being broke all the time. I, I had this as you were Michael Corleone sitting in a vineyard. Oh, kind of thing. You know, I, I, I genuinely thought that you just drew for your amusement. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, I actually didn't have this plugged in, but it was at 100%. And then suddenly it just conked out. It just went down to zero and I had to charge it up again. So sorry about that. No, that's okay. I, I stuck you on my uh, iPad because I was going to give you a little. Uh... Oh, where'd you go? Oh, I'm back. There we go. Okay. Going to give you a little tour of my of my office here. Okay. So you come in. Uh huh. Okay. So there's like my oh. table where I do that kind of stuff. Is hand. your window on your side big? What you're looking at is that the big window? Uh, uh, like you... he's like you're not just looking at the little tiny picture. Oh, yeah, in the I'm corner. looking at the huge, yeah the huge trash. Okay, good. Okay, so you can see more. Okay, then we have Brian has his uh, piano, and I I goof around on the guitar, and there's all my stuff, and then then there's my daughter's area, and there's this stupid treadmill that I'm supposed to use all the time, but I don't. <laughs> and then there you have a massive library i have one sort of bookshelf with all my comics on it so that's it but is it just the very best stuff do you have you distilled it down to the greatest one yes i have yeah. it's definitely the the yeah there's a whole bunch of your stuff in there too yeah oh, good to see yeah right in there <laughs> you know for a guy who didn't grow up with comics you have a lot of geek paraphernalia you know you seem to have you've got into it yes yeah i think that's part of part of the whole like growing up on a farm thing it's like yeah making up for like the 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 uh the scarcity that i had as a, as a child right so now yeah. i'm reliving all, all of that stuff i guess it's it's like um you know people who didn't have many toys growing up become obsessive toy collectors, you know? Is it, is yes, it? yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's silly and it's immature, but it's the truth, yes. <laughs> but it's funny, I think we were just saying like the apocryphal tale was that you were this super wealthy guy and you, you, you were this Bruce Wayne, kind of Canadian Bruce Wayne, who just drew <laughs> amusement, you know? So. No, not even close, yeah. That's amazing. It is funny that, like, I, I remember there were i remember the, the the worst rumor i ever heard about when we went to france was that i had somehow become a, a heroin addict and that's why i was so slow because i had gone to paris and started doing heroin so <laughs> it makes everyone's life it makes me much more interesting but no it was just boring like my life in paris besides being in paris was exactly like my life in Canada or California, it was just me at a table drawing all day. Other than that, it was not very different. In France, uh, did you become Travis Chari instead of Travis Charest? I would say, I would say it was half and half. A lot of people thought, like they to, to not cause offense, they yeah. would say the, they would Americanize it because they yeah. didn't know it was actually French. Yeah. But then the other half people would just said, no, it's obviously Chari because. That's a French word, so <laughs> half and half. And do you miss it? I mean, do you, do you miss living in France or are you quite happy back in the States? I don't miss the winters. Yeah, it's cold. Being in California, yeah. I mean, it's nice. Even when it's cold here, it's not Paris cold. So, mm -hmm. 
but it's it was it was beautiful you know yeah i i there was i like california i mean we're the beach is half an hour away you know there's trees you know that's one thing about paris this it's it's everything's just paved everything's yeah. hard right yeah a yeah. beautiful city it is amazing like what i love with paris is you turn a corner and there's a bridge made of gold or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. Everything looks amazing, doesn't it? It's, and it's no one's incredible. like everyone's just like walking on it, like yeah, like it's no big deal, right? <laughs> and America, and anything yeah, like that it would be yeah. stolen in California. It'd be stolen. Would be yes, stolen, it would yeah. be broken into pieces and taken. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and and nobody writes on it. Like yeah, it would be covered in graffiti in California. Oh, it, absolutely. Yeah. Over there, nope, nobody does it. <laughs> and, what about but, Scotland? Well, whenever you went back to uh, California, you know, like the, the the book I associate you with first when you go back is Space Girl. And that was such an unusual choice for you because were you just re rediscovering your love of simplicity? Was it just, was it that you wanted to do something small and personal that was just for you? Or, you know, because most people would go back and take on Batman or something like that, you know, after being off doing this big European project. What made you pick Space Girl? I mean, I love how iconoclastic you are, that you'll, you'll make these bizarre decisions, which I love, you know? Like, what, what made you do a Space Girl? Um, part of it was I wanted to draw a female character. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of tired of drawing guys all the time. Yeah. Um, part of it was I really, yeah, it's like you, what you said, I wanted a very simple sort of... Um, basic story and i i don't know if it be, if it's clear when you're reading it yeah. but i had i had no idea what the next panel was going to be i absolutely had that impression when i was drawing yeah, that yeah, the existing yeah. panel i yeah I, it, anything could happen right so i like that and i just like the fact that after i could draw for a day and have something to show right i was i was so tired of of people saying you know, what are you working on? What are you working on? Yeah. And not having an answer, you know, not yeah. being able to show anybody anything. And it's funny because I plot everything out so carefully, you know, as most, most people do. But what I loved about that, and I could sense it from the first page as you were making it up as you were going along, and I felt you had no yeah. idea where it was going. Like, you know, when, when she'd be falling into a crater or something, you know, you'd end up this big grappling claw. claw yeah, it's just... You felt like drawing a <laughs> grappling <laughs> claw. But it actually made it really exciting because... I think subconsciously the viewer or the reader knows if the writer knows that if they don't, it's really the Wild West, isn't it? I mean, that book felt insane. Like you'd no idea where that book was going at any point, which made it really fresh. It was really interesting and probably really fun to do. You know? It was definitely, it was a nice change. And um, I would say it was, I really wanted, it was my way of drawing something like star wars but without having all that baggage you know mm -hmm. like being able to draw robots and spaceships and laser guns and weird planets but without having to sift through all the lore and the backstory yeah. and you know the all the the overhead right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something and like it, that and and black and white i wanted to do in black and white and although you were a comic book american comic book fan growing up you must have been super into star wars and everything i get that vibe from your work that... absolutely yes yeah yeah it's i like... i think it i don't know if it's a controversial opinion or anything but although i think empire strikes back is a better movie mm -hmm. you know as strictly storytelling i much prefer the look of the first movie like just yeah. aesthetically i much prefer the way that movie looks like the way there's just so many things that, that you don't see in those kind of movies anymore like very still sort of distant you know shots and not everything was it wasn't frenetic and mm -hmm. i like to i just like the way that movie looked left a, a big impact just visually it's funny because growing up luke skywalker was my hero and later retroactively people say Han Solo, to sound cooler, they will say Han Solo was their hero. And I think people have done that with Empire Strikes Back a little bit too, because it's technically a better movie. You know, it's Evan Kershner is such a great director and everything. Yeah. But like um, but Star Wars, you'd never seen anything like it. Like Empire wouldn't have happened without Star Wars. Star no. Wars was so fresh, wasn't it? It was it was revolutionary. To a to a eight-year-old boy yeah. in a theater, I mean my mind was blown, blown away. Yeah. So what was your other big things at that age? Like, 
in terms of American comics, other movies, TV shows, what was your what was your big late seventies influences then? Hmm. Your formation. Like, uh, I mean, because yeah, as far as comic books go, it was just catch as catch can, like whatever was in the pile that I could find. Yeah. I remember being really into Mike Grell and Warlord. Right. Yeah. Like I remember drawing that guy so many times. I I just I would my sensibilities now are that costume's kind of goofy yeah but back then i thought that was the coolest thing i'd ever seen in my <laughs> life you know like the helmet and everything yeah i just thought that was so cool and i remember uh i don't know if you ever did this when when you were uh 12 or 13 we used to play dungeons and dragons right I, we never had that no it wasn't a thing and uh i used to pour i didn't really care so much about the the the, the writing but there was so much excellent artwork right in the in those books that i used to pour over so were you were you watching like the nicholas hammond spider-man the nick lou ferrigno hulk were you watching those kind of marvel tv shows or anything we into that stuff i think we had the hulk we never got the spider-man i know i know what you're talking about but we never got it i think i was the funny thing is is back then I was probably more into like the Dukes of Hazard <laughs> than the Hulk. Just the, I thought the car was cool. But uh, yeah, I never, I, the, the funny thing is though, is one of my favorite Hulk episodes, or if it was even, I think it was the special was when Thor showed up. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, holy cow, that's Thor. Right. Yeah. Like I, I mean, you watch it now and it's, it's not great, but back then I was like, holy the the concept of someone guest starring right like yes not knowing what that meant but I'm like holy cow the Hulk and Thor are together that and was they're real the first time that ever happened wasn't it because the super it must have been you, you never saw Batman you never saw any yeah. DC characters you know this was the first time yeah. I've ever seen this yeah and I did not like the I mean I've come to appreciate it later but at the time I did not like the Batman show it was yeah. too goofy for me but. You were obviously a little older when you saw it then. Like, what age were you when you saw it? We saw so, because you're up in Canada, we saw so much stuff repeated later than yes. it would have been up here, uh, down here. So I didn't see the Batman show until the same thing, same thing as Star Trek. I didn't see that until I was in junior high. Because it just wasn't on Canadian TV. It, it was shown when I was seven, which is the perfect age to see it because the Batman 1966 stuff feels like the godfather when you're seven that's like the most serious thing you've ever seen and it's right. when you're 25 you realize it's hilarious you know it's really funny same as flash yeah. Gordon, which was written by the same guy lorenzo semple you know that yeah. it was written for adults and children but teenagers hated it because it didn't take itself too seriously so mm -hmm. you were just probably the wrong age to see it yeah but i bet, I sure. bet you love michael michael keaton batman you must have loved that then that was perfect age yeah probably. i like i i guess my i really liked his batman I didn't buy the Bruce Wayne. Right. Like I I just couldn't I couldn't buy that part of it, but he made it he made an excellent Batman. What was the problem with your Bruce Wayne part? I guess I had seen because I was aware of Michael Keaton and I had seen him in so many other movies. Right, right. And he just left such a Michael Keaton impression on me. I could not <laughs> buy him as Bruce Wayne. Right. Like I'd seen like a, I didn't he, he just him because he, was rich guy. He wasn't an East Coast rich guy, yeah. I just couldn't stop seeing Beetlejuice. Right. Like, yeah. every time I looked at him, I went, that's Beetlejuice. But yeah. when he was Batman, he was Batman. Yeah, yeah. And Christopher Reeve, your Superman, I think. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. There'll never be another... Until the the heat death of the universe, there will never be anybody who can play Superman better than Christopher Reeve played that character. It was oh, perfect. Okay. You know, we talked about timing earlier as well. You know, I think that Superman's created in 1938. 20 years later, it's a television show. 20 years later, it's a movie. And it's this gradual process. And it also was in the century that was America's century. You know, we're in the Chinese century we're moving into now, you know. But it was America's century. America's at the peak of its powers. And it's all about immigration being a positive thing. And Superman's mm -hmm. the ultimate super immigrant. And it just belongs to that time, isn't it? And it's so hard yeah. to do in a different time. Now it's it's almost like trying to do Superman in eighteen fifty now, isn't it? It just doesn't quite work in this world. He's sort of, I guess, the character. I mean, 
people always say oh, he he's so hard to write for because yeah. he's so overpowered and he's so perfect yeah but i mean i think that's an partly an excuse you know just because it's so much easier to make him dark and mm. you know to to bring in like the like the chaos and and stay away from the light i think it's it's just a a, a lack of imagination i think Superman's because the easiest he's character in the world, isn't it? Yeah. And the costume. Why do they keep? I I, I don't see underwear when yeah. I look at. I, I don't look at that as red underwear. That's just yeah. his costume. So it's like the Statue of Liberty or Mount Rushmore. You know, there's there's something it just looks the way it's supposed to look in Superman's. Yeah. Costume. Normal people don't question Superman's costume. You just accept that's how. It yeah. Looks. Yeah. But you, you and I should do Superman at some point. I'm going to carve out a little bit of time. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to carve out a little bit of time and write a Superman thing in the next year or two. And, uh, you know, it'd be amazing. Somebody like you draw on it would just be spectacular. It would be, it'd be so cool, you know. If and then, I was going to draw Superman. Some years down the line, we'll bring it out, you know. <laughs> I would definitely, the one thing I never understood about the way they draw Superman, uh, where some, how, how he's drawn sometimes, is how how uh how ripped he is yeah like how muscular he's he should look like he like they did in the movie he should look like a strong farm boy yes right like he's been yeah. bailing hay he doesn't go to a gym he's not working on his his pecs he, he just happens to be a big physically strong guy Which, so i i don't i don't get it it also makes the clark kent thing so bizarre doesn't it you know if superman yeah. looks like if Superman looks like Fabio or Schwarzenegger or something, then yeah. Clark Kent, Clark Kent's going to find it hard to fly under the radar at the Daily Planet. You know, if he's this—it's hard to be like meek that, yeah. when you're yeah. completely, you know, a physical yeah. specimen. So it is funny that people say Superman's hard to write, and I think Superman stories can be about anything. They can be set in the past, the future, other realities. They can be. Yeah, big there's a whole science stories. fiction world there. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, the character himself, I think, is so complex and interesting that. He's a guy that's a unique character where the secret identity is the fake persona. You know, that he's invented this this character. Yes. He wears glasses and trips over his own shoelaces. Yeah. You know, but who, you know, Spider-Man, all these characters, nobody else is like that. It's, it's so interesting, I think. It's possible to give him, like, I guess, pathos and, like, conflict, but without turning him into a monster, right? Like, yeah. without turning him into Frankenstein. Yeah. You know, you there's so many ways to to get into like the you know because obviously he has faults and flaws but why tear him down you know like i don't get it well do you keep up with the marvel movies and all that kind of thing do you do you check out all this stuff uh having a having a, a four, 14 year old kid helps right because yeah. you know you you have an excuse to go to the theater yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not just by yourself in the theater um i I would say they were the first sort of sort of block of movies that they made were so well handled and mm -hmm. so uh, the engineering behind what eventually happened was so good that it almost seems like they are just they're not even coasting right now they are they're they, they almost look like they don't know what to do the drawing, like they've, they've, yeah. they're They've gotten to their absolute peak, and now someone's looking around, going, "What do we do now?" Like, and they haven't figured it out. I think it's so simple. They've run out of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. They've run out of the great stuff. So they're onto the not just the B list characters, which Iron Man is a B list character. You know, they're they're down to the D and E list characters mm -hmm. now, aren't they? And and also they used to invest in great directors. It was all Sam Raimi, Brian Singer. You know, it was it was Chris Nolan over in Batman. You know. These things are hard to do. And usually, if you th think about the last 80 years of superhero cinema and television, the only stuff that really stands out before 1999 is Superman by Donner and Batman by Tim Burton. Yeah. So if you, don't, if you don't have a great director on these things, it falls apart, doesn't it? Yeah, and if you don't have a plan, yeah, it doesn't feel planned anymore. Yeah. You know, like, I know that they, they stick the two minutes on the end to give this illusion that they're connected, but they don't yeah. feel connected. Yeah, it does. It feels by committee, doesn't it? You know what? What about comics? Are you keeping up to date with any comics at the moment? And reading? I send I'm you all definitely my stuff much more of like a 
like if a, an artist that I follow comes out with something, like yeah. for example, Alex Ross's new Fantastic Four book. Yeah. I got that. And uh, when Mignola comes out with his, his yeah. he's just started something. So I'm definitely more of a, and like there's a, about a, maybe seven or eight artists that I really like. And mm -hmm. whenever they do something, I'll go pick that up. I don't really, I don't follow characters anymore. Yes. Like I used to, like I used to follow the X-Men. I now just follow artists now. I think that's a childhood thing, isn't it? Like usually about Absolutely. 18 or 19, you stop following the character and you realize, uh, you know, there's certain people who make those characters what they are, isn't yeah. it? You, you follow them. So like- I uh, used to actually be invested in that story. Yeah. And now I'm just invested in looking at the artwork. Yes, yeah. And who who are you spotting coming up? Who's who's exciting you in terms of young artists coming up? Oh, geez. Oh, God. I, I'm going to be, it's so rude because I can't remember their names now, but- there's two guys coming up right now. One of them, I think, is working on Batman. He's mm -hmm. really good. Is that Jorge Jimenez? Maybe. I it's so it's so uh, so awful of me that I can't remember his name. But yeah, there's <laughs> two of them that I yeah, and they're two of those guys where I look at it and I go, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure I couldn't do that when I was that age. So <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So uh, it's exciting seeing new people coming through, though, isn't it? Because I am quite aware that, you know, we're in our 50s now, you know, and when I was a kid, most people were out to pasture at like 38 or something, you know, like mm -hmm. I, yeah. I would see people retiring in their 30s, you know, but they'd started at 18, you know, but, yeah. but it's, it's kind of weird. The Gen X guys are hanging on in there, aren't they? And I love seeing new people break through, which is so exciting. Like Pepe Larraz, Jorge Jimenez, there's, a, there's mm -hmm. a lot of really interesting guys, but I'd love to see more. I want to see more great artists. Canada's got a lot. Carol Kershaw. And all yeah, that. it's considering our population. Yeah, it's weird how 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 many actual guys there are. It's it's like movies too. We we yeah. we don't justify how many uh, leading men we've we've created. <laughs> it's weird. All, all your favorite Americans turn out to be Canadian, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's but funny. Canada's got what thirty five million people or something. In if state. that, yeah. If that, yeah. It's crazy. Like, and oh, in terms of actors, artists, they're all from it's, Vancouver too, and that's weird. 500,000 people. That's that, it. That, yeah, that's really strange, isn't it? You know, and, and did you feel Canadian now you're living down in the, down in the States? Uh, do you feel a little Canadian? I, it all depends on what's going on in the world. Like if, yeah. if the United States has just done something really stupid. Yeah, you play up I feel much more Canadian and I tell everyone, this isn't my fault. <laughs> you know, like I had nothing to do with this. So, but uh, I've lived here longer than I ever lived in Canada. I've lived in yeah. California now. Yeah. Um, there was actually something I wanted to to run by you, and I, I don't know if this is going to be controversial or yeah. or whatever, but I, a lot of artists that I talk to are yeah. actually because uh, because I'm, I'm friends with a lot of guys who work in design and development and stuff like that, like like behind the scenes. Yeah, and a lot of them are quite concerned with what's going on with um, AI and right. and art. Yeah, and yeah. they they see. Like they're they see a train coming down the tunnel at them of yeah. of basically you know comics just being made you know by prompts mm. like they're going to remove slowly but surely uh, it might not happen to the biggest guys but yeah. there's going to be a lot of stuff getting made yeah in ten years by by a computer essentially mm -hmm. and the writing a lot of the writing might start going that way too what oh it's already think? happening yeah. Yeah, like, a lot of articles that you're reading. Yeah, books are being written. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk was talking about this the other night, and he was saying, uh, you know, the, there's poetry now that's pretty decent poetry that's been done, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, by, by AI. But I mean, it's everything, isn't it? Because in terms of going to the hospital, you won't need a doctor. You'll be scanned as you walk in, and it's going to be more accurate than someone looking yeah. at an MRI. You know, so are we approaching the singularity? I don't know. Is it the end of the human species? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know. But, but I don't know, nature always finds a way, doesn't it? You know, like it's everybody panics and then everything's all right. You know, like I, I remember yes. reading years ago that in, you know, Victorian England, they were extremely worried about horse manure um, in the streets of London because they, they, they looked at the amount of horse manure that had been there 50 years before compared to now. And they said, we, we estimate by the year 1965 that the horse manure is going to be five feet deep. You know, if, if things continue at the current rate of population. But what they hadn't anticipated was the motor car, you know, and, right. and it wasn't a problem. And I, I do think 
there's always a way around these things. Like, you know, people are pretty smart. The only trouble is AI is pretty smart too. So like, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely going to be some, I guess, uh, some, some people who probably weren't going to get that far anyway might end up getting left behind, I guess. I think when you look at any trend, though, whenever something, when there's a big change, the big mistake is to fight it, and maybe you just try and harness it and make it work for artists. Oh yeah, there's no. So, yeah, this is reality now. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, so, yeah. so the big mistake is to think you can avoid it. You know, so I think sometimes you just have to think, okay, how can I make AI my slave instead of right, uh, right. my enemy? You know, so like. I mean, it's like whenever those computer programs come in that would let artists kind of draw New York in the background, you know, and they would mm -hmm. just figure over New York. Maybe we just work that way. Artists just work differently. Um, but it is happening so fast. That's the thing that's creepy, isn't it? We're, we're entering at a weird period in human history, isn't it? Like self-driving cars is, is less than five years away, smart motorways and so on. So the idea of there's some states in America where 20 percent of the jobs are driving jobs. What happens mm -hmm. to the economy? What happens to the German economy whenever the car industry collapses, which is twenty percent of the German economy? What mm -hmm. happens when 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 that moves east? You know, like so. But but in one of those weird periods of massive change, aren't we? but that can be exciting too. Excite, yeah, and but I guess frightening. But yeah, if you if you em embrace change, absolutely, it is exciting. Absolutely, you don't want some AI that can do Travis Shade five pages a day. You know, so. uh, no, because uh, I guess it's because like, like as soon as you can create software that can do that, you can right. create cheaper software that can do that. Exactly. And so eventually there'll just be an app yeah. called comic book artist yeah. and you just plug in the name and it just spits out pages and then, then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the AI. It's like the Netflix algorithm. I always tease guys at work about this, but I say the algorithm just tells me what people liked last year, you know? And yeah. and I feel AI is a bit like that. It's not showing me what's new in art. It shows me what has been in art. So I think people are pretty good at coming up with new stuff. Like what AI could be Bill Sienkiewicz, you know? Like Bill, Bill Sienkiewicz will draw yeah, something yeah. tomorrow that no one has ever thought of, you know? But he's and, like one of one. Like Bill is like... Yeah, he's amazing. I love him. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And the fact that he is just as pin sharp, like in his wit and his sensibilities as he was 30 years ago. Unbelievable. Bill started drawing comics when I was like 12, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's he's insane. as long as Absolutely. practically I've been alive, yeah. And, and he's better than he ever was, you know? Like, I'll just yeah. look at the stuff he sticks up on Twitter. I mean, most yeah. people, most people, t I think you're a guy who's got better. You know, Frank Whiteley's got better. Olivia Coypel's got better. Most people kind of have a parabolic curve to their talent. You know, that they, they run out of energy. They run out of gas a little Yeah, there's like a bell curve. Yeah. Run. Yeah. But I think you, you guys like you and Bell, it's the perfectionist. I know you hate being a perfectionist, but that's what makes you who you are. You know? But the, the annoying thing about Bill is that he's, he does it and he looks like he's not trying. Oh, like he trying. just, it just comes out of his hand. I don't, yeah. I don't know how he does it. He's amazing. Like, he just lets it go. That's what he does. I wish there was more to his stuff as well. You know, like, I mean, but maybe that's the scarcity is what makes it beautiful as well. You know, like I've got everything Bill's ever done, including over there. I've got his revolution book, this new, new collection of his art. Like, and if you're one of those guys that bangs out two pages a day, nobody's got all your work. You know, I always, I, I guess I think like, as, as we're talking about apocryphal, I guess I always thought of Bill as like the kind of, guy who only works because he wants to <laughs> right like does, does bill need to cover the the rent anymore probably not he's yeah he just seems like he he's constantly inspired and so whenever he's, he's inspired he makes stuff yeah which is good but the, the the guys who are there's some guys who don't seem like human beings isn't they're like you can't oh, imagine, yeah. you can't imagine them going to the grocery store and buying toilet roll or something like that you know it's like the, I can't Devin's imagine them being good. interested enough. Yeah, like like Alan Moore, like Alan Moore must make his breakfast and boil the kettle and things like that, you know. But you feel as if he exists on some celestial plane, don't you? Yeah, I mean, like, does like like who like do they have cats and who's cleaning the cat <laughs> box and like who washes the who does the dishes and takes out the garbage, you know? 
<laughs> like Steranko, I feel as if Steranko wakes up every morning in chains and he has to break out of the chains before he has his breakfast. Like there's some guys whose life should just be an adventure, isn't it? Like Steranko can't be a real person, you know? Yeah, he is. Yeah, I mean, some people are just. I'm. I'm. I am so crushingly normal. Like there's. <laughs> It's funny that the, those people, those, those stories got, if, if they had any idea of it, just how common everything was. But isn't it nice that every artist I know and every artist you know has all your stuff sitting about and they'll, they'll open it up when they're stuck and they want to try and uh, get through a page it, that they're struggling with, that they open up one of your things to inspire them. That's a nice way to think, isn't it? I, I do think, I do appreciate that. I just wish that I had more stuff i just wish there was a bigger catalog out there you're only 53 I, I, I just wish there was more you're only 53. but yeah next week there'll be one more to you're, put on the pile you're younger than uh daniel craig james bond you know so like you, you, <laughs> yeah. you've got plenty of time left you know? <laughs> oh yeah i'm not i don't feel like i'm not worried about like uh you know that my that the, the end is near or anything yeah. like that i just i mean it's like any you know you just think about all the the goofing off that you did in your 20s right. and your 30s and you just think oh i you know why couldn't i have just got my act together a little bit better so but the goofing off is also what keeps you sane isn't it you know like i spent most of my 20s just bumming around you know just having a good time and i wouldn't change a thing about that because those are nice memories aren't they you know and 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 that's also what brings a flavor to your work the fact that you have a life like if you hadn't goofed off you'd never have met rochelle and had a kid you know no, no, yeah, definitely not had the kid. I, <laughs> I was going to ask you how, because you you joke quite often that you've just been out with your pals and you have a crushing uh, hangover. Yeah, all the time. How how do you, if any of this is even remotely true, how do you do this at our age? How do you still? I, I think I just wrecked. I can't bottle. do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've done a, I've done a bottle of wine while we've been sitting here, you know. But like, I don't know. I, I think I'm. I'm just lucky that I can. You, your I've got a capacity must be unparalleled. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I never, I never imagine. get too bad a hangover. I never get a hangover so bad that I can't work, no matter what. That you know, is like amazing. I, and as I get older, the hangovers are smaller, which is weird. You know, uh, I'm the exact right? opposite. But that, I that's feel horrible. Worse. You know, I what I worry about is I think if I destroyed all my good brain cells and there's just nothing left to hurt, <laughs> there's nothing to hurt in the morning. You know? <laughs> I or or it's the converse it's like what you're doing is actually like you're you've preserved them somehow <laughs> right like they've been pickled or something right like so if I you stop because, because we work from home so much at the time i find i have to go out in the evening you know because i think it's the balance you need it in your life don't you so so i find um you know i'll do stuff with the kids put the kids in beds about half eight or something and then i'll go and my, my wife and i the kids don't even know how often we have a babysitter come in, you know, and right. we'll, we'll go and see a movie or go for a drink or something. And I get with pals a lot and everything, you know, but I, the pub is such a part of British life. that It is, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, I what is the name of your local? Four nights a week, easily four nights a week. In the what, what's the name of the place you go to? Oh, I go without, to... I guess maybe you don't want to tell people. Yeah, I don't Sorry. want to, in case anyone shows up. But like, <laughs> I, I, live bet I live between two countries. I live between Scotland and England. I have a house in both both places and I travel between the two quite a lot. So in Glasgow, I've got a lot of pubs. There's maybe five pubs that I keep in business in Glasgow, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's there's a great pub called the Athol Arms, which is fantastic. The the Doublet is an amazing pub. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, actually. The Doublet Bar in Glasgow has looked the same since 1962. And the man who sold it about three years ago or something, um, the rumor was that somebody new was going to come in and change it and turn it into a kind of really fancy place. And my friends and I said, we're going to buy this pub. We're going to have to buy this pub and preserve it to be exactly the way we like it because it was a regular, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we found out one of the guys who was putting a bid in said, the only thing he's going to do is fix a broken toilet seat and change the hand dryer. <laughs> the hand dryer hasn't worked for about five years in the men's toilet. And we were like, okay, he can have it, you know. So he, he wow, bought, okay. you know, so, so like the pubs are very important to Scottish people. It's, it's, yeah. our, it's our little community center, you know. Yeah, we don't really have that here in California. That's not a, we don't have that kind of heritage here. It's too spread out. California's too, uh, you know, like yeah. two best friends can live an hour and a half apart, can't they? But in Scotland, everyone can walk to each other's houses. Yeah, we don't go, I mean, after eight o'clock here, nobody goes anywhere. 
right? That's, That's everything that's just kind of closes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm only half an hour from San Francisco, which is yeah. very different, but even San Francisco is not like Scotland in that way. I thought you were um, south. I thought you were down towards San Diego and everything. So you guys are not? No, we are, we're Bay Area. So yeah, we're about 20 miles south of San Francisco. My wife and I were looking to move to Montecito a couple of years back. Oh, it's beautiful. And yeah. we moved to England instead. But like, uh, yep. But we at last minute, we kind of bailed. COVID happened and everything. We did our green card. Yeah. Netflix did our green card for us and everything. But I don't know. I think the sunshine would be too much for me. I think I, I need to live <laughs> in this cold environment, you know. So how is the uh, farm? I've seen you with cows. Yeah. How many cows do you have? You said six? Well, I've got a little piece of some farms, you know, like I bought into a couple of things that, you know, okay, okay. Scotland, and I read so out where fields. you are right now, you are not on a farm right now? Uh, no, I'm in the middle of a city right now. But okay. I, I have, a, I have a, a piece of a farm that's maybe two hours from here. And and I also have lots of farmland up in Scotland as well, you know, so I, which I rent out. Um, so is it a weekend thing then? Um, it used to be when I lived in Scotland, but now I travel up maybe once a month or something like that. So I, I don't get up as often as I used to, but I love it. You know, like there's nothing better, especially in COVID when everybody else was locked up. It was oh, like yeah. fields, you know, to walk around in. And, yeah. and the rural communities just carried on as normal because they were providing all the food and milk and everything. Right, right. So, so it was good. It was great. So, so uh, well, and your kids obviously love it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got three daughters and uh, and, and they love it. But they're, they're also... You know, they, they like cities and, and living between the two is good. You know, they're young enough that they can still go out and play in the farmland, but they love being near cinemas. And, I've, you know, I've, I've got the kids into all the things I'm into. Like in mm -hmm. lockdown, for example, um, I I got them into everything a 50-year-old man would be watching on TV. So yeah. they were watching Columbo. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, my nine-year-olds come in from school when she went back to school. She said, Dad, none of the other kids know, play Columbo. You know, and I was like, no, really? They don't know what that means. <laughs> so they, she was trying to get games of Columbo going in the playground, and the kids were like, this isn't happening, you know, so. <laughs> Do, um, I know that you, uh, you're, you're I, I don't know uh, how old she is, but your one daughter just had a, a show? Yes, my oldest daughter. Yeah, she's a terrific artist. She's a really Yeah, how did that go? amazing you know and, and what i love is it's evolution isn't it you know like there's a monkey and then there's a human being and i'm the monkey and she's the the, the human you know so right she's, she's the perfected version of absolutely. yourself yeah, yeah exactly and i'm so happy right now this week she's got a show in croatia and last week she had a show in uh, paris and everything you know so and i'm so proud of her you know i mean uh, she's my oldest isn't it weird when your kids like eclipse you it's amazing. like when you're like it's like wow how did like you're they they are a separate entity yeah right and, and then you know i'm not the i'm not their el i'm not their elder their teacher anymore they their whole life is their their thing now yeah it is funny Crazy. i i think i can give her some advice and everything you know so i'll sit and talk to her because on, on some level i'm in the arts world and everything you know and i'll, yeah. I'll, and I'll give her some advice and she'll be like that's it's okay i've got this you know so <laughs> right and, right she's so much more wise you know like my my thing is so much more sort of crass and commercial, you know, the, my advice to her. And she's like, Dad, I yep, have to be yep, cool, yep. I have to be cool, you know. So, yep. like, I, I can't do that. So, um, but I've I love seen some of your doodles. I can, I can see her. Um, you have a lot to, uh, like, have you ever drawn something and been like, how about that then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I would, I would never dare. I mean, her art is so, it's funny, like, I think when she was about 12 or 13, I saw her art getting better than mine. And my yeah. other, my 11 year old just now, I can see her about my level just now. And I know yeah. she's going to surpass me in the next couple of years. And my nine year old, I can see her. She's only just started getting good, I'd say, in the last year or so. She was taking a little mm -hmm. longer, but she's she's got enthusiasm, which is amazing. You know, so she yeah. drinks all the time. And I can see this exponential growth in her artwork because she's drawing constantly. What about your, your daughter? She's 14, you say? Yeah, yes, she... yeah she's 14. Uh, it's funny. There must be something in the blood because my mother uh, painted. My yeah. sister can draw, and yeah. I could draw, and by the time she was eight or nine, yeah, she could. She left Rochelle in the dust a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So, uh, she they joke quite often about that, and uh, she definitely, she has not. It's funny how like you you always expect your kids to be interested in what you're interested in, yeah, but she has a totally like her style and mine radically different and i i could not do things the way that she does the way she does them i just couldn't yeah. do it 
and just uh, but yeah, she she draws constantly. What's her inspirations? What does she what does she look at? I don't know. I think these days it's so different because it's so much they have access to so much stuff that we didn't have like yeah. TikTok and YouTube. You know, there's so many things that she can look at that I didn't have access to. So she has a very sometimes it's it's really specific and yeah. then sometimes it's just 10 different things so but she's it, not it, she's it, not into comic books at all even even manga she's not checking out anime or manga or anything no no she uh i think everyone like when i finish a piece we we always have a habit of whenever she finished something or i finish something we always show it to each other yeah and she looks at it and she goes oh, okay yeah i like her hair or <laughs> she's never blown away by anything I'll tell you that. never like geez dad no that never happens <laughs> she's not impressed <laughs> that's amazing i love the idea though of a new generation coming in like the cubert's always fascinate me in the in the Rumitas. you know that that multi-generational talent is mm -hmm. so interesting isn't it and there's a third generation of cubert's now as well of course you know yeah so like uh so i, I love that i love the idea of comic book dynasties like I wish mm -hmm. I wish Jack Kirby had had twenty grandchildren. You know who I know. Yeah, it'd be amazing. Because I do think that there's something to be like there, like with my mother and my sister. Yeah, there's something that was in us, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So who knows if, like, if Frazetta had a, had a couple more kids? Yeah. Right. Like. Yeah. Who knows? Like there it. must be something you you see like footballers. Their kids are great footballers, right? They're, yeah. There's got to be something passed down. Oh, every other industry, if you think about it, carpenters, the son follows them into the business. Yeah. You know, teachers, they follow yeah. them into business. Even if it's so just it's a combination of nature and culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So my kids are exposed to art all the time. And they also have that genetic thing. The are mm -hmm. probably towards it too. Yeah. So I was kind of surprised when all three of the children were artistic. And then a couple of, of course, they're going to be. It's like all they see, isn't it? So it's, mm -hmm. it's an inevitability, isn't it? Or they'll be, they'll be, Farmers, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it's funny. My youngest kid is really interested in farming. She's nine. And we were up at my father-in-law's farm um, a couple of weeks ago. And she was just looking in the, the cedar, you know, and she, there, was a, there was a blockage. And she was in there, you know, just covered in dirt. And I hate getting dirty, you know, but she's, she's in there, doesn't care. And she's uh, fixing it with her, her grandfather and everything. And I thought, it wouldn't surprise me if she goes that route. I kind of love the idea of... Uh, a farmer daughter in there as well. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, a little earth scientist. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What's that? I bet I better get to bed. Like uh, it's getting a little late here, but I mean, it's been twenty four years in the making, but we finally uh, yes, yes. The worth, the, the the worth, the world has been waiting for this. <laughs> and th listen, I w thanks again for doing such a, an amazing job. It's a chunk of your life, you know, like three years or yeah. whatever. You know, it's a big chunk of your but life. The entire COVID thing, yeah, it just. Yeah. And I couldn't love it more, you know. Like the, the the comic came in the other day, and I I just read it, and it's it's just great having you page one through the final page. I, I, it is nice to have a finished thing, absolutely. And we'll have it as a trade soon, and everything, and with yeah. a bunch of other great guys, you know. So, uh, but thanks, and and listen, stop being so hard on yourself, and trust the fact you're so excellent, and everybody. Yes, else. yes, just, so excellent. Yes. Google, Google yourself, Google yourself, and see what people are saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bad, bad idea, bad idea. <laughs> Listen, like, Travis. So I hope, hope we catch up in the flesh at some point. You know, like I mean, I'm in, I'm in LA relatively often. You know, we should grab a grab a tea at some point. We are going. We're doing a family trip to uh, Ireland next year. Oh. I know that's quite far from Scotland, but maybe on oh, the eve of our leaving, I'll let you know, and maybe I'll jump maybe over. something can happen. It's literally twenty minutes. You know, so like, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump over and we'll go for a pint. That'll be great. Okay. Great. Listen, all say, say hi everybody for me. I will do. Right. See you soon. Bye then. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in. Just to remind you, this month, that's The Ambassadors 3 with Travis Shiri. Can you believe it? The Ambassadors 4 with Olivia Coipel. Nemesis Finale Issue 5 with the great Jorge Jimenez. Nightclub Issue 5 with Juan and Ramirez. And The Ambassadors Issue 5 with Matteo Bufagni. What a lineup! Absolutely brilliant. I'll catch you all next time and uh, thanks again. I'll see you.